Okay, so we'll, uh, if everybody move to their seats, take their conversations outside, we will, uh, we, we can, we'll get started. Um, so for the legislative panel portion of uh, today's program, I thought it would be, um, I thought it'd be really helpful to sort of get an overview a couple of things I wanted to accomplish with this uh, panel this afternoon was one to give you all a sense of what these fine gentlemen deal with on a daily basis uh, as legislators and especially as legislators who uh, have stood up against the tax increases and the step up plan and been vocal about it some of the things that they deal with uh, where they get their support from where they get their energy from and their advice to you all on how to how we can all better do our jobs and better increase our conversations with legislators on these topics uh, and we'll have some time at the end for some questions but i'll i'll quickly introduce our panel and then uh, we've got a, a presentation uh to do as well chuck strong representative chuck strong uh, house district 69 from the jinx area we've got scott mckeechan house district 67 from south tulsa we have dave bond who's the vice president of the advocacy for ocpa and then myself and i'm gonna uh, chuck and and uh, scott are going to give a, a presentation here and then we'll do i'll do some questions and then we'll do questions from the audience so gentlemen take it away <clears throat> Testing. First, thank you for being here. Uh, it's truly an honor. Uh, Scott and I both are uh, members of the Oklahoma GOP Platform Caucus. It's a, as you know, a caucus is a group of like-minded uh, individuals. There's uh, in the House, for instance, you've got the the Rural Caucus, the Veterans Caucus, the Majority Caucus, which are the Republicans. And uh, what we formed last year, last, uh, last spring, when we saw so much insanity going on was the Platform Caucus. What the Platform Caucus is, is it's a group of like-minded legislators, and there are about 15 to 20 of us, who really were seeing things in our state that we felt went contrary to the principles of both the Republican Party and conservative principles and values. So what we did is, is a couple of us got together and started thinking, how can we impact, how can we influence our state government? Because traditionally what has happened is there, there are plenty of conservatives in the legislature, both in the Senate and the House. And you have this in, in every legislature across the country, you have it in Washington, D.C. The problem is, is how do we have an impact? How do we influence both policy as well as fiscal decisions that are occurring in our state and in our nation? And what's happened in the past, and I watched this for my first two years, and then I realized, wow, something has to be done, is conservatives get picked off. And it's not that we compromise, we just haven't been as effective as we would like to be because uh, there are, it's just easy to pick us off. It, we, we essentially have been marginalized for years and years. What the Platform Caucus does is it's, it's, it's given conservatives something to rally behind. It's given us, it's given us a platform on which to stand, and you know, rather than it being what does uh, what does uh, John Tidwell think, or Dave Bond, or myself, or Scott McEachin, it, it's not based upon what do we think. It's based upon what does the Oklahoma GOP platform think, and so that's really the rallying cry that we are standing on. And what that's done is it's, it's been powerful. It's really been extraordinary. So we have a group of legislators that we, we pray together. Uh, we're really brothers and sisters in arms. Uh, we, we stand with each other. We'll, we'll meet before important votes. We'll talk about things. Uh, if there are policy or fiscal decisions, we'll, we'll try and support each other. Occasionally, somebody needs to vote the other way, but, but it's not without somebody coming and saying, hey, listen, I got to vote the other way, but here's why. And, and it, does it mean that we're unhappy or, but no, the answer is no. We, you know, we kind of put our arms around each other 
and we do our best to, to keep going a coalesced, unified dis direction. And so I'm really happy to share that even during this, this last round of what I'll call insanity, uh, that, that the Platform Caucus and believe it or not, the Democrats uh, both stood up and we said no to some of the largest tax increases uh, in our state history. And so, Well, I, pr I appreciate that applause, and, and I'll, I'll take that back and, sh and share that with uh, other members of the Platform Caucus. But, but uh, Scott and I proudly served together on, on that caucus, and uh, really it's, it's a tremendous honor to, to represent you uh, in our constitutional form of government. So, Scott, you want to say a few words, and then we'll jump into the slides? Sure, and I, and I will, as a lawyer, try and keep it to a few words. Uh, you know, the, the, the question is, uh, what do you, where, does, where does your strength come from? And I, I would say two, two words, faith and, and, and spouse. And, and I think that, that probably Chuck would echo those, those two words. And, and we do pray for, our, for each other quite a bit. We, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I come, if, if I weren't elected, I'd be sitting out there still with you guys. And, and really, whether or not you're talking about evidence-based, fact-based, data-driven, whatever, uh, one of the things that, that we're going to get into now, and especially my contribution is going to be, once you get elected, you, you get an immediate uh, uh, instruction in just how difficult the process of budgeting and getting things to be the right size is you you understand that I mean the rubber the the rubber meets the road and you're the tire, and 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 so you you start to feel those pressures you feel those responsibilities I'm 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 uh, I'm glad to have uh, the opportunity to feel those pressures and feel those responsibilities with the help of of Debbie McEachin and uh, and God. Scott, I, I think that one of the things that is really interesting is I, I know that before the opportunity opened up to, to serve my state, uh, I always wondered why do people have such a hard time doing the right thing, right? I mean, really, that you campaign and and you and I see a I see a head, right? And so people campaign on a set of promises. They say they're going to do something. They get elected, and suddenly. What happens, right? We all scratch our head. We wonder, what the heck? And, and I'll, I'll share with you, it's really, believe it or not, the answer is very simple. People generally run for office because they feel something here. They, they feel like they're conservatives or they think they're conservatives or they want to contribute to their, to their city or state or nation. The problem is, is that's not life. That's not how real life works. In order to really be an effective legislator, you have to take what you feel here, and it's got to move from here up to here, and turn into a and turn into a a red or a green button. That's all the choices that we have, and that's a very difficult concept, and and it's very challenging. Now, you being here is an important part of that process because you're our backstop. And we don't have all the answers, but what we have are you all. And so while some come in uh, loaded for bear, we're rush babies maybe, or we're, you know, we, we just have years and years of, of having history and learning, um, a lot of people they don't come in with a whole lot of background. So making that transition from moving what they feel here up to here and then making a red or green decision is a challenge. And that's where you all come into play because we need you guys to be engaged and you are engaged. If you weren't engaged, you wouldn't be here right on a Saturday afternoon. So I just want to say thank you and I appreciate you all. So, but that's... So with that said, we're going to move into our legislative panel. Uh, we, Oklahoma, really, we, we just weathered a monumental storm. And the reason it's a monumental storm is because we can see this. 
Uh, the blue line is what happened to oil and gas. The red line is what happened to our gross receipts. So what you'll hear is you'll hear about tax receipts. If you read, and, and one thing I'd encourage everybody in here to do is go out to the treasurer's uh, website and read the treasurer's report. While I may not, while I may not agree with a lot of the, the verbiage in the report, the data out in the charts is invaluable because it tells a story. And what this story shows us is that our state was recovering from the 08 crisis. And in 2014, literally the bottom dropped out of, uh, of the economy. And uh, Scott, you want to jump in here and share a few things? Well, the, the thing that, that Chuck and I shared uh, earlier, uh, and, and the reason he handed me the mic, I'm glad he did. Uh, I, I, was, I am the, the son of a, a petroleum land man. Uncle was a petroleum geologist. I oil and gas title lawyer by trade. I've, I've lived the, quote, ups and downs of the oil and gas industry. I want you to, to look at the blue line, which is oil and gas employment, because people will kind of draw you this nice, regular sine wave type curve for the, for the pattern in the oil and gas industry. If you'll notice, it goes down like a rock, it kind of rises, 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 and then it goes down like a rock. And, and that has to generate uh, thoughts in our minds uh, uh, with respect to the uh, uh, type of tax revenue we need to, to generate uh, by source and the, and the dangers in, in over-reliance on, on energy type tax sources. I wanted to, I'll, I'll give you the mic in 30 seconds at the most. Uh, I wanted to reemphasize something that Jonathan Small said earlier. And that is, the, the, when he went to the Oklahoma Tax Commission uh, and got those numbers, that the, that the Oklahoma taxable income had dropped $13 billion. So that, that, it's a full $13 billion drop. Now, that's not $13 billion in tax revenue. That's $13 billion in taxable income. But that's the tax effect of that straight down blue line up there. That's, that's the reality of it. So I wanted to... Was, and, and then, of course, there's the carry-on uh, effect of if you're not earning money, you're not spending money. The, and we're, we're just going to show you a couple of charts because these, these charts help us make decisions. So when we look at where the revenue comes from, uh, the vast majority of the revenue, the lion's share, comes from either income tax, which, uh, if you, which is this portion, I'm sorry, income tax, and then uh, you've got sales tax. So the lion's share of our taxes come from both sales tax as well as income tax. And Scott, if you want to jump in here. And, and if you'll use your magic little pointer, notice the 5% is the GPT, the 6% is the GPT. Those are not tax rates, uh, to, to make sure I don't confuse anybody with that. That's, that's percentage of total receipts from, from the GPT source. Yeah, so, so, and we've got, we've got some other charts that talk about oil and gas, but keep that 6% or that 5% in, in your mind. If you're wondering one of the reasons why did we vote no on the, the tax package, lots of reasons, um, but a compelling one right here is this, is the shape of this curve right here. And you can see that that thing is just starting to really take off. Um, this is looking back one year, and this is monthly gr gross receipts going back a year, and you can see how the economy is healing. And that's one of the messages that we've continually been, been trying to remind everyone of. Uh, our unemployment, unemployment rate is approaching historical lows. Uh, it's, it's at a very healthy level, and it's, uh, it's really doing really doing exactly what it's supposed to do. If you look over here, I know it's a little bit small, but you can see from a historical standpoint, looking back about a year, we were at about, what is that, Scott, 4.6 or 4.8%, 4.8%, and right now we're sitting at about 4.1, which is, for all intents and purposes, according to the Fed, um, considered full employment. That's exactly right. Okay, this, this one is a little bit interesting. I wasn't sure if I'd cover this or not, but uh, when we talk about oil and gas and our reliance on oil and gas, um, mining industry, oil and gas, uh, it accounts for about 22% 
of all the state taxes paid. So when we talk about oil and gas not paying their fair share, you know, that's a relative statement. Um, but the data, the data speaks a little bit differently. Uh, they've got about 6.5% of the total employment, but a huge portion of the state's revenue comes in from oil and gas. Scott, did you want to? Okay, all right. Uh, this is another one about oil and gas. You can see, yeah, actually. A huge part of our revenue comes in from oil and gas, but it doesn't come in through the GPT. It comes in from the taxing of the people that are working as landmen, petroleum geologists, reserve engineers, and the money they spend. So it's the income tax and the sales tax that are the big drivers, and, and, and oil and gas industry employment drives those. So I, I keep going back to that, is that the, the GPT is not the lost city of gold. I know that there's a huge, huge, huge public focus on GPT. It's a very emotional issue, very emotional tax, if you will. But, but uh, uh, we're supposed to be the adults in the room that are, that are doing this uh, according to wisdom data. Right. Yeah, and that's one of the things that um, when the economy first crashed in 2014, 2015, um, I had somebody, uh, we were at a Bixby event, and somebody came up and they said, hey, can you fix the funding for the Oklahoma School Science and Math? And I just asked a few questions. I said, what do you do for a living? And, and, and just got some basic background. And it was interesting because by the end of the conversation, she actually understood why there was a massive uh, hit to our state economy because she did hair. And prior to, in like the 2013, 2014 time frame, that, you know, people had come in, spend, you know, $150 for a haircut and didn't think anything about it. But after oil and gas crashed, suddenly everybody's coming in looking for a $25 haircut. Well, all of, all of those decisions where we've all tightened our belt and we've had to make those tough decisions within our own personal household, um, that trickles down and it impacts what our state tax receipts look like. So while, like Scott said, while uh, GPT uh, may not reflect, actually GPT doesn't reflect the real picture. It, it shows a picture, but it doesn't reflect the real picture. The real picture is what happens in our economy, our personal households, as a result of the crash in oil and gas. Yeah, another thing that, uh, to that point, uh, again, these are all data points. We, we really wanted to share some data with you guys before we get up to the forum, but we lost over 20,000 oil and gas jobs in our state, and a lot of those left the state, and a lot of those were six-figure incomes. And so when you, when you lose a ton of high-paying jobs, um, there, it really has a major impact on how the state can operate. Scott, I'm gonna let you take this. So this is my favorite slide, so this I'm gonna is, let you take this This is this Chuck's one. favorite slide. And, and uh, so at, at, at caucus retreat, Chuck goes, hey, I'm not gonna be there, so, so do this for me. This is classic Milton Friedman. And this is the problem of the third party payer. If Scott McEachin is spending Scott McEachin's money for Scott McEachin's benefit, I am worried about both the quality and the price. If, if I'm spending my money for Chuck's benefit, I'm more worried about the price than how good the product is. Vice versa, if I'm spending Chuck's money for my benefit, I want the best. Sorry, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we, as a government, are spending somebody else's money for somebody else's benefit. You're all's money. Right. That good, good, well played, sir, well played. <laughs> we are less likely to concentrate on the price or the quality. We're just, quote, getting services to people. And that's a, that's a nice political talking point sometimes. It's a true political talking point sometimes. It's a fact sometimes. But you understand the challenge. And, 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 and Dr. Coburn this morning was talking about how to get some kind of pricing mechanism back into the delivery of health care because you grab any of the 100 and 49 of us, any of the 101 reps, and I know there's a vacant seat, uh, or, or 48 senators, and, and, and we're going we're gonna, to you know, point that out. So. Yeah, and uh, really this, this slide right here philosophically explains why we need performance audits. Um, 
you know, Otter Jones is here, and uh, and he and I he and I have talked about performance audits. Uh, our number one appropriated agency, not the agency that gets the most amount of money, because I think right now healthcare has exceeded education in terms of total dollars uh, received, but but education is the largest appropriated agency. Common Ed, as far as we can tell, has never had a performance audit. So the idea that the agency that we're appropriating the largest amounts of money to has never had a performance audit, and and again, there are three kinds of audits. You got a like a a, a, a fiscal audit, which all of our businesses do on an annual basis. You know, you have people, if you, if you have a regular job and you see the auditors come in every year, that's a fiscal audit. That's make sure that if you have one and one, it equals two, right? Uh, there's uh, another type of audit, which is a forensic type audit, which if there's gross negligence or if there's a lawsuit or something like that, they can come in and they can do that type of audit. What a performance audit does is it allows people, maybe industry experts or uh, a team of people, maybe a couple legislators, some industry experts, some, some other folks, uh, to come in and to look at how does, how does a business operate? Is it operating efficiently? Is it operating according to good principles? Are there too many people in this division and less, not enough people in this division? Are there too many divisions and so on and so forth? Now let's circle that back around and talk about Common Ed or any of the other government agencies, um, the question becomes, are they operating efficiently? So I'm a huge advocate of performance audits. Uh, you'll hear a lot of the legislators really beat us up, and uh, decorum has kind of left the building on the House floor because they beat us up on the House floor now, and that's okay. But um, but, but it's not okay. It, well, <laughs> it you're right. You're right. You're right, Scott. It's not okay. For and what, uh, purpose represented. Yeah. And so, um, and we all who we all know who we're talking about. But uh, but we we do get beat up because. They say, well, you guys want performance audits, but that's not going to fix the immediate problem. Well, guys, that's like saying, well, there's a hole in the dike, and I'm not going to at least try and fix it today because we know the dike's going to break and it's all going to collapse. We've got we've to gotta start somewhere. And if it takes a year or two or three or four years in order to get the system to where it really is operating efficiently, then so be it. Let's start today and get the ball rolling. So that's that's why I like performance audits. A couple of quick things. One, something I've, I've said a lot. Uh, houses of representatives uh, have both the power of the purse. I like to say that also includes the responsibility of the purse to make the, the, the right amount of money get to the right place at the right time. And the other is a, a personal journey, uh, which is what I'm basically going to, going to share when we get to the stage. So. I found a senior auditor in, a, in an accountant firm that, that, that Debbie and I have used for a long time, and I went in there and I said, can you tell me the parameters of a performance audit? And he said, they are what you want them to be. And I said, you mean you don't have a checklist? You can't, there's no gap, no gas, no this is a performance audit, A, B, C, D, E? No. So we can target these things. To, 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 to study the problems that we specifically identify, which should allow for uh, a, a decrease in time to get them delivered and, and, and a, and a uh, 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 control over the cost of the, of the performance audits because they, again, are what we define them to be. Yeah, and I'm, I'm an engineer. It's what I do when I'm not serving as a legislator, and I've done it for almost 30 years now. So I design circuit boards, write software, and, and anybody that's written software knows, uh, Terry's out there, uh, and Terry's a software guy, um, that we don't know what we don't know until we actually build it and start testing it. And so, uh, you know, everybody says, well, what are you going to find? How are you going to fix this? And my answer, I'm proud to say, is I don't know. That's the job of the performance audit team. And all I know is I know that there's enough low-hanging fruit that when they start auditing that it's going to have a significant positive impact upon any industry that we do performance in, performance audit. Yeah. And I think... Do you, do you want to run through your, your Ed slides real you know, fast, or do, do you, you want to retreat to the... You want to? Yeah, let's, let's just go up to the stage. Up to and you. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's a uh, good time now. I will say that I've got uh, three slides up here that talk about NAEP scores, 
If you were in here, uh, Jason Nelson, who I used to serve with, uh, he is exactly right. Uh, NAEP is National uh, Assessment of Educational Progress. And go out, look at the NAEP scores, look at the NAEP data that's out online. Uh, I think the latest ones are from 2015, but uh, Oklahoma is not dead last in terms of our NAEP scores. Uh, and so we're actually for the most part, uh, all except for, I think, one area, uh, we're pretty much on par with the rest of the country. Um, we all want to do better with educating our kiddos. Uh, but uh, I just want to encourage you that uh, NAEP actually paint. All right, now I talked about it, so we got to look. Okay, so the one that, so the one that, uh, this is fourth grade math. And this is eighth grade math. So this is the area where there's opportunity for improvement. And NAEP has done, uh, NAEP actually grades both fourth and eighth grade is what, what those scores are. Uh, let's see here. Okay, this is reading uh, fourth grade and eighth grade. Uh, it's, I found it interesting that, you know, we've heard a lot of noise about the, four, the third grade reading test and how stressed out our kiddos are over it, but there's no doubt that it's having a positive impact on, uh, or the emphasis on reading in those early years is having a very positive impact on, uh, on the reading outcomes of our kids. And then uh, this is science and, uh, again, fourth grade and eighth grade and you can see that we're we're really closely tracking with the national with the national NAEP scores so uh, you know while we're not knocking it out of the park we're not uh, we're not getting killed either so um, that's those are kind of some reference points because you know that really performance and outcomes is really is really what we're after and so with that uh, I guess we'll flip back to where to now and I just wanted to put in a quick uh, uh, advertisement for reading partners. Debbie and I are reading partners. Uh, one of the things that the grassroots can really do, one of the things we're really good at is actually getting, you know, person to person activity done. Uh, my reading partner's awesome. And uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, experience. I, I, I have to work like crazy to get from Oklahoma City to Tulsa to have a chance to do it. But uh, uh, truly, if you, if you get a chance to, to participate in reading partners, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. So uh, I think this is a, a, a perfect lead into uh, exactly what it says on the board there. So now what? Uh, you know, where do we go from here? Obviously, the step-up plan uh, is seemingly is no more. Here, 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 here. Uh, but we're certainly not trusting that it is no more, and uh, we're not resting on our laurels either. What's your view of uh, what the next steps are? What are you hearing? What's your sense of where um, things are going to go in the Capitol? Is the reform side of it? Uh, is there more energy and life discussion going into that? Where are we going from here? Now, you've spent significant time in the Capitol. So uh, do, do you think that any of us can, can uh, truly predict where that building is going to go? When your, wife, I, I when your wife asks you, so now what? How do you answer that question? That's the, that's the question to ask. I, I, say, I say, Debbie, we are going gonna to look at some numbers. Um, like I said, you've never had a romantic Valentine's evening until you've been uh, in two different cities uh, on the phone talking about whether per, pu per pupil spending at Raiden, Oklahoma is truly $43,000 a year. It does. I mean, it was, it was an incredible moment. Um, one of the things that I'm going to do is... Uh, uh, Scott, Scott's a nerd. Can you tell? I, I thought you were As gonna, am I. I thought you were going to commend me for my sense of humor. A funny nerd. You see how civility nerd. has left the building? <laughs> Thank you for that, Representative. So um, uh, one of the things that has been mentioned uh, and, and really needs to be emphasized is that the, the, the vote on the step-up plan, 1033XX, was, was uh, held on the Monday, eight days before the Tuesday. That'll be on the quiz. Uh, the 12th, was it held on the 12th? With the, with, the, with the numbers, the actual numbers coming out on the 20th. So when people say, why did you vote against 1033 XX? I say one of the things is it was premature. We didn't have the real numbers. So I am going to uh, email to Rhonda and she can, can distribute a link 
to the uh, uh, Board of Equalization Revenue Certification for fiscal year 19. That sounds exciting. You know, ground pounding you know, under the lights on the strip, Irwindale Raceway. Uh, but uh, uh, um, the, the, I asked Jonathan Small before he left, and uh, I, I said, what, what is the most important number in this report? And he said, it's, it's the fact that you've got essentially a $1 billion increase in the amount of appropriated revenue in, in fiscal year 19. If we had thrown $800 million on top of that, you're looking at 1.8. If you, if you count the, the uh, 331, because I know Chuck looked at the uh, Board of Equalization uh, presentation from December. I mean, yeah, when you might not be the only nerd on the, on the, on the platform, Representative. Uh, but you get to about 2.1. And that's a uh, so we've got we've got a billion from from uh, a billion uh, uh, in in growth. We got uh, 0.3 from from uh, uh, some revenue increases that that uh, uh, I, 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 I voted for. I've I've answered for that. Um, yes, yes, he has. Yes, I have. Uh, and uh, but anyway, uh, remember evidence based, uh, fact driven. Uh, and so I will, I will get these links uh, out. I'm going to uh, start uh, uh, a, a, a continued conversation uh, with anybody who will talk to me. Uh, Auditor Jones is now going to run the other way when he sees me coming in the building. But, you know, what are these real numbers? What, what can we actually do? And, and uh, uh, we've, we've picked on Auditor Jones. We haven't picked on Commissioner Murphy back there. But I know that Commissioner Murphy would like to come would like to come talk to us about maybe a, a buck or two, you know, maybe a... <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been monopolized. I'll, I'll quit and give Chuck a, a chance, but the, um, the, the, uh, and then, uh, uh, so these are the appropriated numbers. I think the more the grassroots knows, uh, the, the actual data, uh, the more effective, uh, uh, and really, I want everybody to know. I want, you know, the school board members to know this. I want the teachers to know this. I want everybody to know this because we are supposed to be a self-governing, virtuous people. And I believe, and if I didn't believe we uh, could not still achieve that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be in office. So uh, I want to applaud everybody in here because I know you're going to go look at these numbers. The other is, and I'll, I'll just say this, I'll, I'll, I need to uh, understand better the specific parts of the 214-page consolidated annual financial report. But that's, that's the real, man. no I'm not. Yeah. Look at them, they're on the edge of their seats. Yeah. There is not one person out there whose head is like this. <laughs> and Rhonda, thank you for locking the doors. Yeah, um, what Scott talked about the the C consolidated annual financial report, you'll a lot of times you'll hear it referred to as the CAFR. So if you hear the word CAFR, that's really what it is. Um, let's let's touch base a little bit on the uh, the CLO bill because I know that there's a lot of there's a lot of interest in that. And uh, or or maybe let me ask you guys, where do you want us to go with this conversation? Do you want to hear about the CLO bill? Do you want to hear about something else? Uh, John. Oh, John's got well, some questions. I did, I, the CLO bill is part of the, is one of the. Yes, is a discussion. I'll let you drive. This. Is, no, the CLO bill is. Uh, please do talk about that because I think there's a lot of discussion going on about that. We're hearing about it. And uh, I think we're starting to find out that there's some folks who maybe within the Republican Party who are not going to be supportive of that idea and are going to fight it. So please give us give us a sense of where that stands now. All right, so the CLO bill, uh, the uh, Constitutional Land Office is a, a, a commissioner's land office, thank you, Scott, uh, is a constitutionally created um, body that essentially owns or manages a lot of government uh, property and what it and right now I think that they've got uh, investments and property across the state uh, valuing what about 2.2 billion dollars roughly 2.2.3 when, when you read this yeah. uh, report that you're going to read 2.3 yeah, as go. of the end of 17 there you go so um, so it's over two bit two billion dollars uh, of assets of core assets and what happens with that 
is there there's a portion of that money this last year they earned so over 300 million dollars and about 146 let's say 140 million that I'm going to give you rough easy numbers to work with about 140 million of that was streamed through and there are uh, about 70% of the money is streamed through to Common Ed, and then about 30% of that money is streamed through to about six other agencies. Now, that money, if you think about it, if, it, if they brought in $320, $330 million and were streaming through 140 some, 150 million, Excuse me. What what happens to the rest? Well, currently the remainder, the balance, 170 million roughly, is is being reinvested into the principal. So it's being rolled over into the principal and then reinvested and then generating new revenues. Uh, Tom Gann, Representative Gann, has a bill uh, which proposes using those additional dollars as a way to fund a teacher pay raise. So rather than raising taxes on the fine people of Oklahoma, what the idea is, is to take those dollars that are already streaming in from that fund, think of it like a fund, it's a consolidation of a bunch of different sources, and using those dollars to fund a teacher pay raise. Now, the idea, and Tom and I talked a little bit earlier today because I wanted to make sure that I, that I conveyed his thoughts correctly. So the idea is not that it's going to have a committed pay raise. The idea is that because part, some of the, some of the opponents of this, of this idea say, well, you know, how are we going to fund a, a certain pay raise of X thousand dollars a year when we don't know what the earnings are going to be off of this fund every year? And the, the, what, what the proposal is, is that this would be something that it would be on an annual basis that those dollars would then stream over to a like a stipend for our teachers. And it would be very, very clearly targeted to make sure that it goes to the classroom teachers, not to principals, not to superintendents, not to administrative staff, but that... <laughs> Th th thank you, Rhonda. And Rhonda knows that whole issue is near and dear to my heart because uh, one one of the things that uh, one of the things that I worked on a couple of years ago was the definition of a teacher. And I encourage you all to go out and Google the Oklahoma definition of a teacher. Uh, and when you read it, then call your legislator because we we actually I say we got it fixed back in 2016, and then couple of legislators changed it back to the old definition, but the way the definition currently stands and the way that it's been for years and years, the first word in the definition of a teacher is the word superintendent. You don't get down to classroom teacher until you get about halfway through a multi-line definition of who they consider a teacher to be. Now, the reason I mention that is that's a huge problem. The reason it's a problem is because when, when you all, when I, when the people of Oklahoma say that they want a teacher pay raise, what I hear everyone saying is they want Mrs. Jones, who's teaching little Johnny and Sally, who's in the classroom all day to get a pay raise. I don't, I don't, the feedback that I've received from, from everybody is they don't want the, the school principal and all the higher paid folks to get a pay raise that they want our classroom teachers to get a pay raise. So that's a, that's something that I've been pounding the table on in the legislature now for three years. And, uh, and so we're still trying to figure out how do we sort through this, this, uh, really conundrum is what it is of how do we make sure that the money goes where it needs to go. But but uh, Representative Gann's bill uh, is really a true free market uh, conservative type of proposal. Uh, it's not going to be a $5,000 pay raise. The money streaming in is about $170 million, uh, which if you figure about $50 million uh, per $1,000, it would, it would uh, come out to about a probably somewhere around a $3,000 pay raise, but regardless, it's a heck of a lot, it's a heck of a lot of money every year, and so, so it's a great idea. Well, and I know Representative Calvi also has a bill that would change, uh, it would require 60% of funding go directly to the classroom, 
which if you looked at both of those bills, a combination of them, could have a significant impact, not just on the amount of money that's going into, uh, or the amount of money that's going directly to teachers, going directly into the classroom, and really making that change, because I think that your point on the CLO, there's, that's a great opportunity there, but making sure that it's not shanghai or railroaded um, is really a key piece of that. And if they also Shanghai the railroad, then we're really in big trouble. So we know that's uh, certainly true. I wanted to John, talk. Can, can I yes, add please, something please. Really, yeah. really fast? Yeah, the, the, the numbers, because uh, you all are going to go to page 37 of the, of the 2017 CAFR. But uh, the total program revenues from the commissioner's land office, $322.8 million. But distributions, $100 43.6 million. So uh, we're really, go I'm going to lose everybody in the room except for Linda LePac if I start talking about the common law wasting rules. But if it's truly, if the 322.8 is truly available and not part of the corpus of the fund, see, I, I didn't lose no, John, but I not, did. She's, she's, I did like, she's nodding her head. She's like, <laughs> I did, I did, and I did no, amuse him. But anyway, uh, and the other thing, uh, and, and this is, uh, you can see part of this challenge for legislators and for, for you all as well. The, the, the definitive numbers are the numbers on as of June the 30th, 2017, which sounds like a long time ago. So you have complete numbers for the fiscal year that ended the, 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 in, in, in June of the prior year, and you're trying to make decisions on the spending from July of, of this year to June of, of 2019. So you can see part of the, the challenge to any legislator, any activist, anybody trying to get money to classroom teachers is, is to have actual, actionable intelligence on finances. I want to ask about, um, as we talked about what's next, I want to talk about is specifically with the step up and how that advocacy piece worked. I, I know Dave and I've had this conversation many times. So earlier this, earlier this morning, uh, for those of you who were uh, not here for the breakfast and did not uh, hear that conversation, uh, Dr. Coburn's remarks, it was very good. It's on the OCPA live stream, so you can, I'll send you the link. You may not have it. Um, uh, Dr. Coburn remarked that uh, by his count in the legislature in, at the Capitol, there were, it was over 250 taxpayer funded lobbyists. On this stage, you have two funded taxpayer lobbyists. These two people. That's the difference. So where you have 200, it was, it was, I think the number was 265 or so. We'll talk later. 265 or so lobbyists who were paid by the taxpayer to lobby to get more taxpayer dollars. That's the big piece that we run into is you have that, you have those efforts going on. And you have OCPA and you have AFP who are actually at the Capitol trying to uh, change the misinformation that's going to legislators. But Dave, from your standpoint and what we deal with from an advocacy side, what are you, what are the big pieces that that this audience needs to know what is the what is that missing piece, and how can folks get more involved in both what you work on, what we work on, and actually uh, he, that folks can hear from legislators, hear speak to their legislators, and they will hear from their constituents. Uh, I I think that the main thing that folks should know is that you know your lawmakers, your lawmakers, your senator, and your representative, wherever I think most of you are from the Tulsa area. Uh, <clears throat> they're hearing from people all over the state that they need to be taxing more and spending more. The, most of the time, the majority of the people they're hearing from are not their constituents. And when merely a handful of you reach out to your representative and your senator, it's very powerful. As long as you identify yourself as one of their constituents and it's something they, they have the ability to verify, and they do, um, <clears throat> It's extremely powerful. It really doesn't take that many actual constituents reaching out to one of them to express a perspective to get their attention. Uh, both our organizations offer some pretty easy ways to do that. Uh, and you know, if, if you're concerned about taxes up or down, if you're concerned about spending up or down, which obviously most of you in the room are, then just utilizing those opportunities to quickly 
communicating those ideas with your lawmakers, and then getting back to your day. I think both of our groups try to make it as easy for you as possible. Ours is just a simple click here. It's a preset email. And you click it and you go, or you can edit it if you want, but it takes very little time. And ours is set up so that it does identify you as one of their constituents. Um, and and it, it directs you straight to them. And I, I'm, I think their system works extremely similar. So whichever avenue you use, I don't care, but doing that, don't ever discount that that doesn't make a big difference. It's awesome if you can show up in person, but how many of you really have the time to do that? And so making that available is something we really try to do. And, and thank you for those. Most of you in the room have utilized them at some point already. Rhonda is approaching the stage, and so I'm just going to hand her the microphone because that's call? what I've been, tra I've been trained, to, trained to do that. So. No, I want to tell you guys that because of you and your activism, Tulsa County has one of the most conservative representatives and senators in in the state and so it's because you do do what they ask you to when when we ask you to call and we ask you to write it's because you do reach out and so please don't ever take it for granted that what you're doing does not matter because it does and it's and it shows by the voting record of the of our representatives and senators in the state thank you Hey, John, let me let me add to that um, sure. uh, from a legislator's perspective. So here's what we deal with when we receive constituent emails or phone calls. Uh, first off, we receive thousands of emails and phone calls, sometimes every week, depending upon what week it is. Um, if you don't identify yourself as a constituent, uh, you're probably not going to get a response. I know in my office we just don't have the bandwidth. We have one assistant and that assistant is responsible for doing uh, a ton of things as well as servicing all the emails that come in. Uh, frankly, it's a full-time job some, some weeks just to go through and to figure out which emails are from constituents and which aren't. So if you put in there, I'm a constituent, Put your, put your address, um, that's a huge, huge step in the right direction. Uh, it moves you immediately to the top of the list. Um, we still confirm, but it moves you right up to the top. Uh, the other thing is uh, phone calls are very, very powerful. Uh, and again, the first thing, hi, I'm such and such, and I'm a constituent. Again, it moves you right to the top of the list. I, I heard one extremely liberal uh, legislator say this, yeah, it was earlier this week, uh, that if they get one or two calls on an issue, it gets their attention. If they get seven or eight phone calls, that's a lot. That's enough to influence and to impact their decision. Uh, so I encourage you to absolutely make those phone calls, send those emails. If you use a form letter system, go in and you can even put a note, this is not a, sta I have, this is not a standard thing or change something at the top so it doesn't look like all the other emails that are coming in because if it's an important issue, Sometimes we'll receive 10, 15 emails, and if they all start looking like the same, um, we'll read the first couple, but if they all look the same, um, and if they're not constituents, then we have a tendency, you kind of know where, what, you know, what's happening with that, um, that we're getting blasted. So you don't want to look like you're just part of a blast email. Uh, the last thing is, is if it's an education-related subject, a lot of the members, the first thing they do is they call their superintendent. What should I do? How should I vote? It's, from my perspective, it's so frustrating because they've already made up their mind as to how they're going to vote on a lot of these education issues because their superintendent is the first person that's reached out to them or that they've called and that they've got a connection with. So on, if it's an education-related issue, folks, we absolutely need you to be engaged on those issues. I want to give. Uh, we've we've been go we're right at three thirty now, and I this was uh, we marked this as about our end time for the day. So I wanted to give uh, be respectful of, of your time, but do we have one or two quick questions from the audience besides Gary Jones? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> let me let me run out here. And by say run, I mean let me lumber off the stage and halfway walk out to the crowd. 
My yes. question for the panel is, with the audits that you're talking about to find out exactly what's going on in all the different areas, would those pay for themselves and allow us to get an audit firm in the state, the auditor's office, to increase the staff enough where we could continue these on down the road to make sure that everyone was staying accountable? I think I've heard a lot of predictions. I know I've heard a lot of predictions that they would pay for themselves. I'm going to go back to that uh, point that I made earlier, that you start with something that's really focused that you can get back quickly so that, that we actually get good uh, usable data in, in a real-time way from the money we spend on auditors. And, and, and um, uh, so these performance audits, remember I said, they, they, the, you set the parameters, the legislature would set the parameters. I think that's your question, which is whether or not we could learn enough, fast enough, reasonably enough, that we would save more money than we spend. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but I have a sense that we might be able to do just that. Yeah, actually, I'm going to do a follow-up. Um, that actually is the sticking point on this issue. Uh, when we talk about performance audits, nobody wants to pay for them. Uh, and it's the most frustrating thing. I'm old school. I'm a business guy, and to me, doing audits is just a part of, it's a cost of doing business. It's a part of doing business, right? I mean, if, you're, if, if any of you all are in private business, you know that doing audits is just a cost of doing business. Somehow or another, we've decided that government is a preferred class, that it's like lives outside the bounds of normal, uh, normal behavior, and so we're not supposed to do audits, and if we do them, that the agency isn't supposed to pay for their own audits. Now, I'm old school. I think that an agency should have to pay for its own audits and that you do audits periodically and based upon the results of those audits, you either increase the audit frequency or you decrease the audit frequency based upon how that agency is performing. Again, strictly a free market business model, but that's, yes, sir. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, so what the gentleman's if, right, right. And, and so for the folks that were in the back that may not have heard that is, is, and the auditor is, is just stood now standing up. up so, so, oh, no, yeah. I'm not sure if he's going to throw rocks at us or not. But what this gentleman said, he's from Creek County is, is, is that they've got to actually pay for their own audits out of their own budget. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Auditor. Okay, first of all, you're paying for them, not getting them. That's right. Okay, let me, let me say this. I'm, I'm sitting there listening to this, and I'm thinking, okay, in two th since 2011, we have pushed to do performance audits on a rotating basis. It got held up by a senator by the name of Clark Jolly. He passed the House overwhelmingly, got held up, and he said it was growing government giving us too much power. What they did is they created a performance team under OMES and they're giving them more money than would be available to do these audits on a rotating basis every single year. And when I'm sitting here listening and, and I'm going, this is just unbelievable to be with you folks. I mean, everybody wants to talk about auditing today. Where have you been for the last eight years? You know, and, and I, will t I will tell you that right now, we pushed every, we got four different bills we pushed. Three of them got killed. One of them, we had a bill that back in 2008, there was a bill that created a Joint Committee on Accountability, Glenn Coffey's bill. The problem was it got vetoed by Governor Henry because it created an extra bureaucracy underneath the Legislative Service Bureau that was a duplication of the Auditor's Office. Even Governor Henry understood that that was a duplication. That's exactly what's being proposed today. It's a duplication. The other thing is, that we ran the bill, Governor, Governor Fallon vetoed the bill, we've run it again, that creates a, a joint committee on accountability which is made of House members, Senate members, Democrat and Republican, nonpartisan, and people from the auditor's office, a team, just like Senator Coburn says, you need a bipartisan commission, that is it. Representative Mark LePac ran that, there were three accountability bills that ran last year, it got more votes in the House than any other one, but never got heard in the Senate. Because what they did is they created a new commission. 
to, to now take unelected bureaucrats and supposedly to work with the auditor's office, but now what they're saying, oh, we really don't want to work with the auditor's office, we want to use somebody else besides the people that are elected to do that. Now, when the incentive, the, the look at the tax incentives came out, David Dank had what I think is the best interim study in the history of the, of the state. They recommended that our office look at every program and approve them to make sure they're meeting the minimum requirements and that we audit the programs to make sure we're getting a return on our investment. The legislature came back and created another commission made up of non-elected bureaucrats and the reason they said because the Chamber of Commerce did not want the state auditor's office looking at their books. Yeah. We said, real simple, don't ask for state money, we won't look at your books. Yeah, Mr. Auditor, let me jump in here if I may. Yeah. Last year I actually worked with the auditor to, to have a bill, I, I authored a bill to audit Common Ed, utilize the auditor's office, and they put it in a committee basically to kill it. The only way we were going to, that I would have been able to get that bill out of that committee uh, was if I moved the authority of who would do the audits from the auditor's office to another agency. Right. Well, and, me, so, me, and, that's, and that's what we're dealing with. Let me tell you how it should work. About four years ago, the Corporation Commission came to us and said, we're thinking about hiring internal auditors. But we really don't know what they should do. We don't know who to hire. We don't know how they should be managed. We said, let us give you a suggestion. Why don't you hire us and we'll put embedded auditors in your agency. So what we're doing is we go and do a risk assessment of the entire agency and come back and say, based on that risk assessment, here's what we think you ought to look at in what order. They have approved. Now, they, they sit down with us and approve every audit that we do, but everyone we've approved, or everyone we suggested, they've approved, and virtually every recommendation we've made, they've implemented. Folks, that's good government. That's the way it should work. And, and the idea that you're going to put non-elected bureaucrats in charge of something, the legislature, the House, the Senate, and the auditor's office, the ones that are elected to oversee, that Joint Committee on Accountability will do that. In fact, this bill that people say in the, the Committee on uh, uh, Budgets and Accountability, folks, those are, those are conflicting functions. Budgeting is an accounting process. Accountability is an auditing process. You don't do the accounting and grade it. But that Joint Committee on Accountability will provide the legislature a lot better mechanism to get done because what you're doing now is you're empowering the Speaker and the Pro Tem. And in, since 2004, there has not been one, uh, there's probably been a hundred different requests come from legislators for audits. But not one has been approved by the Speaker and the Pro Tem since 2004. Now, you can call for them. It takes 10% of the registered voters as citizens. That's why you see on a small basis they're done. Is there, is there a way that the citizens can demand audits from certain organizations? And if so, what is that problem? That mechanism is 10% of the governing body within that jurisdiction, or that, the, the voter within that jurisdiction, which means if your school district, for instance, we had a, a city, city of Medicine Park. They put together a petition, went out and signed, they had to get 10% of the registered voters. Of course, when your, your number of registered voters is 279, that's not too hard. <laughs> the, the problem is, when you have 2 million registered voters, it would take 200,000 signatures. That's almost impossible. That's why this Joint Committee on Accountability empowers the legislators working with the auditor's office to get what they want done. And any legislator that wants to come to that committee and say, we think this needs to be looked at, we think this needs to be audited, they can make their argument to that committee, and that committee in turn can authorize that audit. Thank you. Sure. Is 
communicate facts, not just emotion, and communicate it not only to the person that you want to go vote that way, but everybody else around. And don't get sucked into this path of believing that most of the people in the legislature are only operating on influence. There are a lot of really strong, principled people in elected office in Oklahoma, and they are struggling, and they need to know that they've got more, you've got their backs, that you know what they're doing, that you're informed, <coughs> and that you're going to stand up and be counted when it's time to be counted, because they're getting marginalized. People act like they're crazy with the things they want to do, and they, that's what they need, and that's the way you can help them out. Get informed and contact your representatives with the facts about how it's going to impact you and what you need to have happen. Thank you. I want to add one last thing as far as paying for them. When they said growing government is giving you too much power, what I said is you give me 10% of the savings to operate my office, we can do it. We've got time for two more questions. We and then some to, you know, the medical schools at OU and OSU. So th there are a lot, of, it, a lot of swirling dynamics right now. It's, you know, just speaking clinically, it's a lamed up period for the executive branch. That, that time can often be a little chaotic. Wh whoever is in that position, that is very normal as well. So I, everybody's emotional right now. The federal level stuff, national political stuff is adding to that and enhancing it and amplifying it. So I, I do think uh, there's, uh, looking through all of that noise and saying, okay, there's this much money, these things are important, that, you know, the Republican majorities at the state capitol want to have a teacher pay raise before they get to November. That's a very realistic desire on their part. It would be very advantageous for them to have that. So they're trying to figure that out too. And, you know, these guys represent districts that are some of, you know, electorally some of the most conservative in the state, but many of their colleagues don't. Many of the, their colleagues are from Little Dixie. Uh, many of their colleagues are the first ones to ever be Republicans holding those seats. And so there's a lot of dynamics that are going on right now. Uh, we're, we're never sad when a tax increase fails at OCPA. I think it's safe to say that. But please, I, I do hope when you're communicating with your lawmaker and other folks you know at the state capitol, that there are a lot of emotions. Emotions are higher than they have been in a quarter of a century or more at the state capitol. And we, we, we appreciate these guys a whole lot. We appreciate the collaborations we have with AFP and with 912. And, and thank you very much for having us. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I, there's, yes. Yeah, get, one last thing, sorry. And I want you to have the last word. State question 640, there's gonna be a push to weaken it or to repeal it. I don't think there'll be a push to repeal it, but there's gonna be a push to move it back from a 75 to a 60% uh, vote in order to raise taxes. Uh, please be vigilant. Yeah. Rhonda, what, yeah. Well, uh, yes, the, the problem is, is that you're gonna, you're gonna see legislators, here, here's, here's how it's gonna play out. <clears throat> you're gonna see legislators say, well, I would never not wanna send something to a vote of the people, right? Because that's local control, right? And so that's, that's the legislator's way of dropping the ball on this. And so, uh, Folks, we're gonna have to just be vigilant about weakening state question 640. The answer, Rhonda, is yes, but we're gonna have to really get out there in front of this thing. And the reason I say that we gotta get out in front of it is because if it goes to a vote of the people, I guarantee you there's gonna be so much money and so many sob stories and the sky is falling. And so what you saw in the legislature and that failed because we had some safeguards. We're gonna see. We're gonna see that thing really. You're gonna hear how I'm bad you, it is. I'm gonna tell you something, Chuck. I don't disagree with you one bit. I agree with you 100. percent There are gonna be sob stories, but you know what? We've beaten them four damn times. Amen. That's right. We beat them four times. Right. We beat them on state question 779. Linda LePac, how many times, how many days did you spend in our office making phone calls, sending letters on state question 779? And how many sob stories did we hear? We've heard it a hundred times before, over and over and over again. And we've beaten them over and over and over again. I think the quote, I think the, I think the quote from the school.
The quote, and I'll, I will end on this quote from Tom Coburn this morning. He said, if you all did not hear this, Tom Coburn this morning said, the big dogs don't run this state anymore. The people do. Thank you, guys. This has been fantastic. We'll, we will be in touch with you. Thank you.